we don't get started, people are going to tune in to other people's Bible studies. Well, it's good to have some good competition, and welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. We're talking about Deflate Gate. You know, there's a lot of people out there who are jealous of Tom Brady, and he's got so many Super Bowl rings, he's running out of fingers to put them on. Of course, we have eight fingers, two thumbs, but, you know, there's a lot of accusations running around, and remember this deflate gate story? Now, the first gate was Watergate, and so Watergate was the first political scandal. G. Gordon Liddy broke into the Watergate complex, apartment complex, housed the DNC, the Democratic National Convention Committee, and... That was on June 17, 1972, and we all know about the Watergate scandal. So what happened was, every scandal that came along afterwards, they would put a gate on it, a suffix. So this deflate gate happened in 2014. It was the AFC Championship game. The Patriots were playing the Colts, and... Uh, I think around halftime, one of the Colts had intercepted Tom Brady, and when he went to intercept the ball, he noticed that it was a little deflated. So the Patriots won the game. They, I mean, they blew the Colts out 45-7. to seven, and So there were some charges and accusations that were brought forth, and the NFL had a, an investigation. I was reading all about it on Wikipedia. And the thing about it is, is that the NFL had their own internal investigation. And they invoked all the lawyers. As I was reading the case, uh, Tom Brady ended up getting a four-game suspension, which he accepted. Later on, they regretted. Robert Kraft, the owner, regretted uh, accepting that. They said they owed it to their fans. They should have fought it legally in court. But as I read about it, I... I remark to myself really that there wasn't much proof beyond a reasonable doubt it may not have stood up so I don't really know a lot about uh, the ramifications of the Flategate other than the accusations that were being charged and people were accusing the Patriots of cheating and but you know they said that the football was underinflated that they were using deflated footballs and uh, I thought, you know, I wonder what that has to do with the Word of God and the plan of salvation. Is it possible today that ministers, not quarterbacks, but ministers, religious people who are teaching the plan of salvation, is it possible that they could be deflating, letting the air out of the plan of salvation and not giving the plan of salvation as it stands at maximum pounds per square inch PSI. So I thought, you know, that's what we ought to do. Now Paul said, thank you, thank you. Got a latte, fresh latte? Is that a hot or cold one, Drew? Can you let me heat it all the way up? You weren't allowed to heat it all the way up. You know, there's there's a relationship between heat, temperature, and pressure. Did you know that, Drew? It's the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law, and that we studied is PV equals NRT, pressure volume equals the number of moles times the rate constant times the temperature. And I, I don't know if Paul knew about the ideal gas law, but I'll tell you one thing he said in Acts 20. When he was speaking to the Ephesian elders, he said, I want you to know in verse 26, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. I am innocent of the blood of all men. Now, when he speaks of their blood, of course, he speaks of their life, because the life is in the blood. Paul said, I am innocent of the, of the eternal life, the eternal destinies of all men, because that went back to Romans 1. He said, he said uh, I'm a debtor to preach the gospel to all men. So he, he followed up. He did his job. What he said he was a debtor to, uh, he paid that debt. He paid his due, and he paid his vows. So he said, I'm innocent of the blood of all men, Acts 20, verse 26, speaking to the Ephesian elders. And then he says, I have not shunned. And that word, 
means I've seen uh, to shrink. I have not uh, shrinked back, or I have not shunned, or in the footnote, I have not avoided declaring unto you the whole counsel of God. He said, I have not shunned. I have not deflated. I have not let any air out. I have not avoided or shrinked. And uh, what word do you have? Do you have a, I have the New King James. Do we have any New Americans here in our Bible study this evening? Anybody got the New American Standard? What do you got? NIV? New King James. What do you got? The Holman? Hey, what does the Holman say? The Christian Standard Bible? Same as mine. Now, what does the word shrink? Doesn't that mean to deflate? To let the air out? Yeah, of course it does. Shrink wrap. You know, you when you want to preserve food, you shrink wrap it and you take all the air out. And that keeps the food from uh, spoiling. So Paul said, I haven't uh, shunned. I, ha I haven't... I haven't hesitated or I haven't shrink back from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So there's no deflating the plan of salvation. There's no deflating uh, the counsel of God. Now what is the counsel of God? Well, I don't know. Uh, we have a lot of Bible verses. Do you, where you live, anybody on the online who's watching, do you guys have anybody that put Bible verses out in the yard? Anybody? Now, some people you know, put it out on their barn, paint a big sign. I've seen, uh, I've seen people put up four by four posts with a Bible verse. But we have some people in Harrisonburg in Rockingham County here, very clever. They use like one inch PVC pipe. Is it one inch? Three quarter inch. It's PVC pipe, and they have the corners, and they go come down, and they have some kind of a plywood or maybe. They put up a sign. It's not plywood. I don't know what it is. It could be uh, masonite, something like that, but it's white, and it's very attractive looking, and they put up Bible verses in black letters, and they've got some pretty catchy Bible verses. I mean, I'll be driving down the road. You can get a whole sermon driving down the road, and you see these, you know, white Bible verse signs out in the front yard, and what I'm told is there's a guy who does that. And uh, you contact him, and he'll put the sign in. And then every month they change it. You get a new Bible verse every month. Well, and they're all good Bible verses. Now, with one exception, there was one time when I drove by, and I saw this sign, and it was Mark 16, 16. And when I saw Mark 16, 16, that grabbed my attention. Because I know that that is a believe and is baptized verse. So if you turn in your Bibles to Mark 16, 16, it should say, I mean, it should say, if you're reading in your Bible, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. So you kind of have an A and a B there. What this person did was he left off the A. He left off the beginning of the verse, and he put the second part, the, he parsed that, and started it with the conjunction. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Well, we know that unbelievers will be condemned. Uh, Jesus said that, uh, that people will be condemned themselves through unbelief. So, uh, we certainly, Hebrews says that without faith it's impossible to please God. For he who believes must believe that he exists, and he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That's Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. So, faith is very important. In fact, faith is a prerequisite. It's some, you can't be saved without faith. But there are other things in the plan of salvation. Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Can anybody believe without hearing? Now some people 
some people think, uh, some of my hyper-Calvinist friends, they, they believe faith is a gift. Okay, God gives you the faith. God gives you the faith uh, that you turn around and believe in him. So he's really granting you, uh, crediting you the faith to believe in himself. Now I have to think about that. Because Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing. And hearing through the word of God. So whatever, whatever faith is and whatever salvation is, faith is a consequence of hearing the word of God. Now, so that implies a person has to have understanding. He has to have comprehension. Uh, he who knows to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. And that's James 4, 17. So anyway, I saw this sign and I thought, you know, that's doing a real injustice because they're quoting the second half of that verse, the, the last part of the verse, but they're not quoting the first part because it said, he who believes and is baptized. Now, somebody says, whoa, you mean you can be baptized without believing? Uh, no. In fact, we know that only believers are candidates for baptism. You know, there are some religions today that, uh, you know, they'll take a little baby and sprinkle water on it, and they'll call that a baptism. That's not a baptism. First of all, baptism means immerse. It's an immersion. you got to go all the way under. It's not sprinkling. So they got the wrong methodology. But worse than that, you know, uh, is that a little baby doesn't have a will. He does has no will in that operation. And so he really can't draw near to God. He can't draw near to Christ. Uh, he can't believe because, uh, well, he's without understanding. Paul said, in your understanding, I want you to be men. I want you to be adults. But in your, with regard to innocence, I want you to be like babes. So find that verse. I just, uh, I think that's in either Romans or Corinthians. Uh, Find that verse for me in your understanding, but in your with regard to innocence, be like babes. So that tells you babies don't even have sin. They're not even candidates for baptism because they're without sin. And uh, Jesus said, unless in Matthew 18, 3, he says, unless you uh, become, uh, unless you're converted and become like little children, you cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. So that tells me that little babies, uh, little children are already in a state of conversion. But we have to have understanding, and that involves belief, and that involves the hearing of the word, and that involves repenting, a changing. A, a little baby can't repent. There's nothing to be repent of, and there's no uh, mental faculties, and there's no psychology wherewith he can even begin to change because he has no awareness, no cognition to, to be, even be aware of. Uh, of, of himself. And, and by the way, in Romans 5.13, a very, uh, very relevant verse, it says that, you know, sin was in the world, but until the law, God did not impute uh, sin. Sin was not imputed until, uh, until there's a law. Without the law, sin is not imputed. And so that tells me that even a little baby might throw a temper tantrum, but he doesn't know what he's doing. So God doesn't impute or account that for being sin. So, so that's what one religion will do. They'll just come along and sprinkle and say, oh, you're baptized, and there's no belief. So how can you be saved? They twist that verse, don't they? Mark 16, 16. But then on the other side, you got the Protestants come along, and they're like, well, he who believes will be saved, and then later you're baptized. But is that what Mark 16, 16 says? Nope. It doesn't say he who believes will be saved and then later you're baptized. I know that's what a lot of, of people who follow the tenets, faith only. That's what they believe, faith only. And yet faith only is really not even in the Bible, faith only. In Mark 16, 16, it says he who believes and is baptized. So you have faith and baptism. Both are essential. Both are necessary for salvation. But he who does not believe will be condemned. So we're just trying to declare the whole counsel of God. We don't want to deflate uh, the plan of salvation. Now let's talk about, did you find that verse by the way? Romans 16 19. Yeah let's look at that. Romans 16 19. Because that was a great verse. It's a 
good work. I don't think that's the one I was thinking about, but it, for your obedience has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf, but I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. So be wise in what is good and be innocent concerning evil. So that, that's a good verse. I wonder if we have a footnote here. 19. Is it Romans 9? What is it? Romans 9, 11. For the two are not yet no. being born. Mm. That's that one. No, 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 no. That's something else. That's something else. Mm. Well, we'll find that. Uh, Look up uh, Babes. Look up babes or with regard to innocence. We'll, we'll find that verse. Let's, let's do some hearing verses here because we're talking about uh, the whole counsel of God. Uh, let's go to John. And I have some hearing and following, hearing and believing, hearing, believed in baptism. Uh, but, in, but remember that faith only is insufficient. We know that. Let's turn to John chapter 12. In John 12, we have a group of people that actually did believe. They did believe that Jesus was the Christ, and yet they would not confess. They would not confess him. In John 12, verse 42. Who wants to read that? 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many who believe in him, even among the rulers, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, so that they would not be banned from the synagogue. For they love praise from men more than praise from God. Can you believe that many of the Sanhedrin, these were the 72 elders, 70 plus 2. They had like an upper house and a lower house. It might be 30 plus 42. 72 could be 70 plus the high priest and there were two high priests but anyway you get 70 72 it says uh, there were in this sanhedrin this and the sadducees dominated the sanhedrin uh, but they had the pharisees were also a part of it kind of like two parties like today we have the republicans and democrats and we have the cameraman that's got to be careful. You're going to give people a headache. Nevertheless, among the rulers, many believed in him. They believed in Jesus. What are they going to do? Jesus of Nazareth. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, a man approved by God to you by the many signs and wonders and miracles that he did in your midst, in the middle of you, right smack dab in your midst, as you yourselves know. You see what, what Peter just did? As you, He turned it around. He's appealing to their knowledge. So if it's a false statement, it's your responsibility to, to contradict. No, no, I don't know. I don't know. I didn't know. I didn't see. I don't know what you're talking about. Never saw any. Never saw any sign, wonder, miracles. Ha. You saw the lame man, lame man healed on the Sabbath. They're mad as hornets. The blind man caused a ruckus the guy was blind from birth and they said that man's a sinner because he healed you on the sabbath day of all things preposterous they're gonna impugn jesus because he healed a blind man a man conspicuously blind from birth the whole town knew that guy and he's healed and they said he's a sinner that's who healed you and he said whether he's a sinner or not i don't know there's one thing i know I once was blind, now I see. All the miracles. What about Lazarus? I mean, in John 16, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. It's so bad that, uh, I mean, turn with me to John 16. This is so bad. Or is that uh, 11? It's John 11. My, my, my fault. They heal Lazarus, and they're so upset when Lazarus is raised from the dead, everybody knows about it. And so they had to have a conspiracy. 
They had a conspiracy. And uh, so some people that were privy, uh, verse 45, John 11, 45, many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did, believed in him. They saw the things that Jesus did. They believed in him. Remember, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Rabbi, we know you're from God. Nobody can do the signs that you do except he's from God. Even Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was a synagogue. I, I'm sorry, he was a member of the, of the Sanhedrin. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, they knew it was beyond dispute, as you yourselves know. In fact, they knew it so well in John 11, when Lazarus was raised from the dead, they said some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did, John 11, 46. And then 47, then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, what shall we do? This man works many signs. I mean, they're admitting it, aren't they? If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Now that word place is very significant. In the Greek, it's, it's the word topos. It's a location. Have you ever heard of a topographic map? It's where they get that word. They're going to take away our topography. And when the Jewish people refer to the place, they're talking about the Temple Mount, the holy place. The Romans are going to come and take away the holy place and our nation. You know, you better be careful what you fear. It's better not to voice your fears, make known your fears. A lot of times your fears may very well come true because that's exactly what the Romans did because of the Jewish, not because of what Jesus did, because of the Jewish rebellion. And that rebellion was a political rebellion in 70 AD, but it started out as a spiritual rebellion, a spiritual rebellion against God because they rejected their own Messiah. And of course, Caiaphas, verse 49, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. You know, how applicable is that today? <laughs> you know nothing at all. I've never seen so many people today so ignorant. People are ignorant. Don't have a clue. Don't have a clue to what's going on. Watching the news media, people are so gullible. So gullible. So naive. I mean, the, the news media, you know, it's so easy. It's like a, a bunch of, a pack of hungry dogs. You know, the population. It's so easily manipulated, controlled. You know, the news media, they got a bone. You got this hungry, salivating dog. <laughs> and you got a bone, and throw a bone over here throw a bone over there, ah, it goes over there, and then, and then these get corrupt politics, the corrupt people just, you know, while the dog's eating the bone over there, they're on the other side, you know, committing corruption. And then they get back on the news media, and throw another bone over here. That's the way they do it. You know nothing at all. Now listen to what Caiaphas said, nor do you consider it's expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and not that the whole nation should perish. In other words, they're going, to they're going to conspire to put Jesus to death. And Jesus' death, Caiaphas says, is going to well, it's going to uh, be a vicarious substitute. That's a repetition. Vicarious, that's Latin. I mean substitute. It's going to placate the Romans, placate the Jews. The Jesus death and the, the people will not perish because of Jesus death and he didn't even know what he was saying because it was expedient that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation should not perish verse 51 he did not say this on his own authority but being high priest that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for the nation only for that nation but also that he would gather together in one, the children of God scattered abroad. He would die for the sins of the whole world. And Caiaphas didn't even know what he was saying. You know, sometimes things come out of your mouth and they're so profound and it's kind of an irony because you don't even know what you're saying and, and yet it's so true and so accurate. Now, what is so funny is uh, verse 53, from that day on they plotted to put him to death. And so they wanted to put Jesus to death. And not only did they want to put Jesus to death, 
uh, they wanted to put Lazarus to death. So even Lazarus. Uh, six days, uh, John 12, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. And there they made a big supper, and Martha served, and uh, Lazarus was one of the ones who sat at the table with him. Can you imagine? Here he had been dead, he'd been in the grave. Jesus had raised him from the dead. And uh, it was so bad, and of course Judas, they're so upset, Mary anoints Jesus' feet with this expensive fragrance, and Judas is like, hey, you know, why did you waste that? We could have sold that to the poor, you know, sold it and gave the money to the poor. He didn't care about the poor. Like a lot of people today, they, politicians, they say, we want to help the poor. They don't want to help the poor. You think they give, take out of their money out of their own pocket and give the poor people? Nah. They want to redistribute wealth and buy votes. They don't care about just like Judas, he did. He was a thief. This he said, verse 6, John 12, 6, not because he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And there's a lot of people like that, a lot of politicians. They're crooks, they're thieves. He was a thief, and he had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. And Jesus rebuked her, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not always have. Yes, we take care of the poor, but Jesus said, listen, you know, she's anointing me in lieu of my death. You know, we can try to declare war on poverty, but the reality is, is that Jesus said the poor we have with us always. He wasn't really, Jesus wasn't, uh, he really wasn't a, didn't come on this earth to to be a social philanthropist, did he? He didn't come on this earth to break down all the socioeconomic disparities, did he? No, he said, we'll always have poor people. But you see, what Jesus did was he gave us the he gave us the ability to get to heaven. So even poor people can tap into the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of God. Even Lazarus, there was a Lazarus. I don't know if it's the same guy, probably a different guy, but he was a poor man and a beggar, and he was able to go into the paradise section of the, the afterworld that existed then. And the rich man who had all the luxuries, well, you know where he went. So poverty, Jesus said to the church in Revelation, he said that you're, you're poor, but he said you are rich. He said, people, you have a reputation. You think you're poor, but you're rich. We need to be rich toward God. Uh, John 12, 9. I've been on this tangent about the conspiracies and how that the people knew. They knew that Jesus was the Christ. They knew through the signs and wonders. And that's what the purpose of miracles was for. Uh, not to raise the dead. Lazarus had to die again. Not to heal. Uh, just for the sake of healing. Because everybody was going to get old and die. You could be healed and be restored to health, but eventually you're going to get old and grow old and die. And the Bible says it's appointed for all men once to die and then the judgment. So all these miracles, what was the purpose? The purpose was to confirm that the prophet was from God and to give the scripture. If you're a prophet, you get your name on the book. You might even be an apostle. John, Matthew, Peter, Paul. It might be a prophet. Mark, Luke, James, Jude. That's the purpose, to confirm your credentials as a, as a prophet, as a messenger from God, to confirm the message. Mark 16, 20, the last verse of the Gospel of Mark said that they went out and confirmed the word with the signs following. So, Peter and Paul and Jesus, all of them, they, they put it on the people that these signs, the purpose of these signs was to approve that Jesus was from God. John 12, 9, the highlight of what we're saying. You know when Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead? I mean, the conspiracy is totally getting out of hand. If you're going to put Jesus to death, guess what? It's not enough now. You've got you to eradicate all of the witnesses. 
It says, now a great many, I'm in John 12, 9. Now a great many of the Jews knew he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. I mean, you talk about being a public spectacle. <laughs> you know, wherever Lazarus went, people not only want to see Jesus, they want to see Lazarus. They want to see Jesus' entourage. They want to see the healings and the blind man. And, you know, how about the gathering maniac? You know, can you imagine? You know, here's a guy that's been the holy terror of the whole community, and now he's in his right mind. They want to see, as you yourselves know. And so guess what? So the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also. So they got to kill Jesus. They got to kill Lazarus. Where does it end? You got to kill all the eyewitnesses. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, there's 500 people that saw the risen Lord and they're still living to this day. Just challenge me and I'll subpoena them into a court of law and we'll put up the evidence as testimony. Yes, it says in John 10 that you hear and follow. And they knew, you see what I'm saying, is that these chief priests, they believed. Nicodemus believed. Joseph of Arimathea believed. The Pharisees, many of them believed. But you see, they would not confess Jesus because they would lose all of their position. They would lose everything they had materially, politically, economically. They would, they would lose everything. Are we willing to lose everything? to be a disciple and follow Jesus. And so confession is required. They believe faith only is inadequate. We see from John chapter 12, faith only is insufficient. Faith only is inadequate. Faith only. You can have faith only and still go to hell because the Bible said, even the demons believe and tremble. So we don't want to deflate. We don't want to deflate the plan of salvation. To deflate the plan of salvation would be to deny water baptism. To de deflate the plan of salvation would be to put only and put an only on one of the things of the plan of salvation. But you see, like the rungs of a ladder, the steps of a ladder, all are necessary. Just like the steps in your, leading up to your deck or maybe your front porch. The, which step is the most important? That's the one that you miss. The step that you miss is the one that will cause you to fall. The step that you miss is the one that will cause you to hurt your ankle. And that's the way it is. And so we know that there are many points in the plan of salvation. Now it says that those who hear and follow. In John 10, 27... We have a great verse. Who has John 10, 27? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Yes, my sheep hear my voice. You know, I, I think I know what's going on with Calvinism. If you look up Calvinism on the Wikipedia, I think they do a pretty fair analysis. You start with the sovereignty of God. What is sovereignty? God is the ruler of, of all. God controls all, and he does. But when they say sovereign, they mean a little something else. Not only does he control all things, but he determines, he causes all things. They get a little funny on that. I think it may go back to Augustine and Calvin. And, and they believe that, that basically God, it's, it's almost like a fatalism, a determinism. God has to determine these things. And so they, they're a little confused over where God's will begins and our uh, ends and where our will begins. Have you ever heard of a free will Baptist? The free will Baptist. You know, see, they do believe in free will. Some hyper-Calvinists don't believe in a free will because you're not allowed to do anything. Have you heard people say, oh, it's a work. You know, we're not saved by works. Well, where does that come from? Where, have you ever done a work study on works in the Bible? Well, no. Somebody taught you that, you know, we're saved by grace and not works. And uh, if it's a work, then it's something you do. And that doesn't save us. Well, how foolish can you get? Because Jesus said, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. And Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Now follow. Is that something you do or something God does? 
He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. Is that ear, the hearing, is that something you do? Or does God hear himself on your behalf? So, think about it. Think about it. In fact, in John, one of the great scriptures, uh, Jesus was rebuking them. He said, you guys, you guys don't care about the preaching. You don't care about the teaching. You don't care about living it. You're just here for the loaves and the fishing. In John 6, he said, I don't want you to labor. And the word labor is the same as work. In fact, I did do a study on uh, works. Uh, ergos, ergo, ergonomic. Ergo is the Greek word for works. And Jesus says, don't work for the food which perishes, but work for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set a seal on him. Then they said to him, in John 6, 28, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. And so we say we see actually from the scriptures that faith itself is a work. Faith is something that you do. Faith is a part of your action. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And how shall they hear it? Unless they send preachers. We've got to send preachers. Unless they be sent. How blessed are the feet of those who preach the gospel. So we've got to hear. We've got to follow. How about John 8, 47? There's another great verse. Hearing and following verse. John 8, 47. He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. So people who, are, who belong to God are going to hear him. And those who don't hear God, well, they don't love God and they are not of God. And there are people in the world like that. Acts 15, verse 7. Now, Acts 15 uh, was the great Judaizing uh, convention. Acts 15. And here they are reporting back to Paul and Barnabas, are reporting back to the elders. And uh, there was a dispute that broke out. We need to you know, bring the law of Moses. The, the, the New Testament Christians should follow the law of Moses, circumcision, and now they're going to make a break. Christianity is not an extension of Judaism. It is a separate and new, it is a brand new covenant. And even though it arose with a Jewish background, with the Jewish prophecies and the Jewish roots, it is not a, an extension. It is a totally different branch. And in Acts 15, 6, the apostles and elders came together to consider the matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said, Men and brethren, you know a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And of course, you know, that was talking about Cornelius. Peter's first, the first Gentile convert, Cornelius. So that you need to hear the word of God and believe, Acts 15, 7. And then probably my favorite verse is the Corinthian situation. Now, Corinth was different because there was the, the only case I know where the synagogue rulers embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ. The synagogue rulers. Who's got Acts 18, uh, verse 8? Acts 18, verse 8. Can somebody read that tonight? Now, I like Acts 18, 8 because it's got three, three verbs. It's got three of the parts, the planks of the plan of salvation. It's got three of them. Chrysippus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. Many of the Corinthians, hearing, comma, believed and were baptized. Three planks of the plan of salvation. There it is. There's your Romans 10, 17. You know, there was a great side verse in Galatians. You know, the people were saying, well, you got to keep the law. You got to go back under the law. And Paul, boy, did he go hard on that. You foolish Galatians. 
Who has bewitched you? Who has, you know, and that's just kind of the way denominationalism is. You know, Caiaphas said, you know nothing at all, and you might remark also, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? There's a lot of uh, deception. Who has beguiled you? Beguiled, you know, the serpent beguiled Eve, didn't he? That you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. And then Paul says, this only I want to learn from you. <laughs> this, this only I want to learn from you. Remember, that doesn't flow very well. Remember, the Bible in English is being translated from the Greek. This only I would learn from you. That's not the way we talk in the street English. You know what Paul's saying? Let me put it in my own words. This only I would learn from you. What Paul's saying is, I only want to know one thing. Have you, in arguments, you boil it down. You boil your argument down to the least common denominator. Reduce it. Reduction. You reduce, just like fractions, right? You guys want to reduce those fractions down, right? So then you can... You can communicate, you can express it, you can add, you can multiply your fractions, but you've got to reduce them down to the most simple, to the most simple form. And that's what we're doing with the plan of salvation. Paul is reducing it down. He says, I only, you Galatians telling us we got to go back on the, I only want to know one thing. You tell me one thing. Now, what's the one thing, Paul? How did you get the Holy Spirit? Did you get the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? We didn't get the Holy Spirit. Now the prophets in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come on them. But like Samson, he would come on them and he would leave. The Philistines are empty. The Philistines. The Holy Spirit. Ah! Samson would be strong, but the Holy Spirit would leave. He's weak. That's not what we're talking about in the New Covenant. We want the indwelling. Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you? You were bought with a price. You are not your own. 1 Corinthians 5. We want the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. And that to, to get the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit, you've got to have a new covenant. You've got to have a new container. we got... We got a new grape juice, and you don't put the grape juice in the old container. You got to get a new cup to hold the new juice. Or latte. So to get the Holy Spirit, you got to have a new covenant, and that's the Christian covenant. The law taught us right from wrong. The law taught us how holy was God. The law condemned. The law stopped our mouths. Through the law, Romans 3, the whole world became guilty. But the, by Moses came the law, John 1, 16 and 17, but by Jesus came grace and truth. And we get a new covenant, the law of Christ, to get the Holy Spirit, and it comes through the hearing of faith. And that's something that we have to do. Yes, many of the Corinthians hearing, believed, and were baptized. You know, it was so funny because Acts 18 is the, is the history of the, the Corinthian church. Uh, you know, we have just a few minutes uh, remaining. I just want to, want to, I want to wax, uh, try to wax eloquent about Paul in 1 Corinthians there was so much division and strife in the Corinthian church. You know, sometimes there's strife in the congregation today. Shouldn't be, but there is sometimes people, when we're working with people, people have their own agendas, they've got their own ambitions, and the Corinthian people were very similar. And then they had their own ringleaders. We follow this guy, we follow that guy, we follow Paul, we follow Paulus. We follow Peter, we follow Christ, and whether they did or not, maybe they're just name dropping. We follow Paul. Oh, you're following me, huh? Is Christ divided? 1 Corinthians 1.13. Was Paul crucified for you? 
Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Were you baptized in my name? I didn't baptize you in my name. I baptized you in the name of Jesus Christ. Now what is Paul doing? Is he putting down baptism? No. Or is he debunking party spirit? Is he debunking schisms and strife? Party spirit, that's when political parties, when, when there's rivalries and seditions and, and gossips and cliques. Because that can affect a congregation just like it can affect any people. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God I baptized none of you. Paul's, he's hot. You know, he's uh, mad as a hornet. Uh, uh, well, except, <laughs> Paul's so funny. I thank God I baptized none of you. Uh, uh, well, uh, actually, except I did baptize a couple of you, Crispus and Gaius. Uh, you know, if Paul were making a universal, I baptized none of you. If he were putting baptism down, when you have exceptions, then you can't have a universal, can you? Can't be a universal. He did baptize a few people. Look at that. He baptized Crispus. Put that together with Acts 18, verse 8. Now I see it clearly. I can see the situ that scenario in Corinth. Paul is the traveling revival preacher. He's in town. Crispus is the synagogue ruler of Corinth. He invites Paul in to speak to the Jewish delegation in Corinth. Paul preaches the gospel. They believe. One of the few synagogues, one of the few synagogue rulers whose heart God opened, they believe the message. Now, is Paul going to baptize the whole congregation? But he's got the synagogue ruler who believes with all his heart? No. He's going to baptize the synagogue ruler, and then it's up to Crispus to baptize the rest of his flock. It makes perfect sense. Paul's not debunking baptism. He converted Crispus. He didn't have to baptize the congregation. You know, it's so funny because uh, I like to make a, a little bit of a, it's an argument, it's a proof. Now, I, I confess, I wasn't good in geometry, but remember those proofs, maybe somebody out there, you were good in geometry and they had those proofs. You got the inverse, you turn it around, and then you got the converse. And I was like, what's the difference between the inverse and the converse? And, you know, you, you turn it around. And, I know this, when you turn it around, when you turn a, a statement, a proposition around, you make it negative. If you turn it around and it's not negative, then you have a logical fallacy. Are you with me? Are you with me? In other words, uh, like in 1 Peter 3.21, Peter said the light figure, speaking of the water of the flood, picked the ark up, brought it from the old world to the new, 1 Peter 3.20, Kicks into verse 21. He says the light figure, analogizing to that, corresponding to that, baptism does now save you. It's not the putting off of the filth of the flesh, but it's the appeal of a good conscience by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3, 21. You know, you could turn that around. Let's take one little letter. Baptism does now. You know, the word now one of the most important words in the Bible because in the New Testament. Because there was a way, you know, God in the past tolerated a lot of shenanigans. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. Now. Old, new. But let's take that one little W and change it to a T. The light figure to where baptism does not save you. You know, you can tell that. You're, you're actually turning it around and it makes it negative. The problem is, if you said that to people today, baptism does not save you, they would agree. Yeah, oh yeah, well, we're saved by faith alone. Saved by grace through faith. Plus or minus nothing. Even, even the late Jerry Falwell. You get that, you can't believe. You water Baptist, you... That thief on the cross was saved. No Church of Christ, no Campbellite ever got him into a Baptist baptistry. I'm doing my Jerry Falwell interpretation. Jerry Falwell Sr. <clears throat> well, I wrote Jerry a letter and asked him if he might want to have a little discussion on the subject. Everybody knows the thief, you know, the thief on the cross. How could the thief on the cross be baptized into the death of Christ, into the death of Christ before Christ died? And we know that. A testament is a will. The will doesn't go into effect till the testator dies. When was the thief saved? 
We're not arguing who died first. When was the thief saved? Jesus was still living, wasn't he? As long as Jesus lived, the old covenant still in effect. The thief on the cross was saved under the old covenant. Jesus, all Jesus had to say, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. Today you'll be with me in paradise. So the thief on the cross is not an argument against baptism. You see, when Jesus dies, that's when the will goes into effect, and that's when baptism becomes valid. And 50 days later, on the day of the 50th day, the Greek word Pentecost, now we have the reading of the will. Now Peter gets up with the keys of the kingdom and tells everybody, men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. We're going to end there. But anyway, the converse, to turn it around. If you turn it around, it's got to be negative. Otherwise, you've got a logical fallacy. Now, in 1 Corinthians 1, and I don't want anybody to deflate. You're not going to deflate. You're not going to marginalize the New Covenant, the New Testament plan of salvation. If Paul were really putting baptism down in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look at this. He said, I thank God I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius. Yes, 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 in Corinth, there at the synagogue. Lest anyone should say... That baptism is essential to salvation. Is that what Paul said? You see, if you're trying to use this as an argument against baptism, Paul's telling you why he's using this as an argument. He says, I'm glad I didn't baptize any of you except Christmas and Gaius. Lest anyone should say that baptism is necessary for salvation. Because that's the argument. That's the line of thought you're trying to say. That's not why Paul put, put it down. That's not why he's glad he didn't baptize them. The reason Paul's glad that he didn't baptize all of the Corinthians, the reason he's glad isn't because baptism's not essential. It is. The reason he's glad that he didn't baptize is revealed in verse 15. Lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. That's why he's glad he didn't baptize any of them. Because nobody is going to use Paul's pastoral authority. Nobody's going to use Paul uh, as a leader or a mentor to justify strife and division and schism and pride. Because Paul said you should be perfectly joined together in the name of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul's upset. Not because baptism is ineffective. But let's end and we'll go here. We don't want anybody deflating the gospel. We don't want to have a deflate gate. In Acts chapter 2, let's go to the first day of the church. Whatever Jesus said. Remember, Jesus is the alpha. He's the omega. The beginning, the end. You know, the day of Acts is a lot like Genesis. Did you know that? Acts is a lot like Genesis because you have in Genesis the beginning of the world. Is it still running? Drew, are we still on? Because I'm really, I'm really, I feel like I'm trying to say some profound things here. Acts is like Genesis. Both are beginnings. Genesis is the beginning of the world. Acts is the beginning of the church. In Genesis, we have the confusion of the Tower of Babel with with tongues and languages. A tongue is a language. In Acts, the apostles spoke in languages because they're consolidating everyone now through the communication, the, the preaching, the hearing of the gospel. The gift of tongues is going to undo the curse of the confusion of Babel and Babylon because Jerusalem is the antidote to Babylon. Babylon is the mother of confusion and Jerusalem is the mother of us all. The Jerusalem which is above the heavenly Jerusalem. And Jesus is the Alpha and he's the Omega. He's the beginning, he's the end. The church began with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They had fire on their head, sound of a mighty rushing wind, tongues, speaking in tongues. And of course the church will end with the baptism of fire, which is the eternal lake of fire. I pray nobody is baptized in the lake of fire. But during the church age, we have baptism in the name of Christ. It's in water. Here is water. What hinders me? Can any man forbid water? No, we have water. Baptism in the name of Christ is in water for the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
In fact, we know that Acts is the beginning because at Cornelius' household, when there was a second installment, perhaps because of the Gentile versus the Jew, a second installment, and Peter said, this is the same thing that happened to us as in the beginning. And he was talking about the day of Pentecost. So Pentecost is the 50th day. It's the reading of the will. And Peter preached the first gospel sermon, and they cried out. When Peter reached the climax of his message, Acts 2.36, he said, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? You know, whatever he tells, Peter tells them to do on the first day of the church is going to be locked in until Christ comes back. They're not going to change. God isn't going to change the plan of salvation. We're not going to have a plan for the Jew and a plan for the Gentile and a plan for the Orthodox and a plan for the Roman Catholic and a plan for the, the Protestant Reformation and then a plan for all the, the modern day cults. No. <laughs> There's one way. I am the way, the way, the truth, and the life. Whatever Peter told him to do on the first day of the church is what we're going to do today. It's what I'm going to do, and it's what you should do. Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, in some places it says hear and believe. Hear and follow. Hear and believe and be baptized. Be, believe and be baptized. And here it says repent and be baptized. These devout Jews already believed. Peter's meeting them where they're at. Later on, Gentiles are going to hear the word of God. They're going to ask what to do. They're going to stress believe because they're dealing with a Gentile audience. You need to believe in this Jesus of Nazareth. He died on a tree. They're going to preach the whole counsel of God. That's what we've tried to do tonight. We don't want to deflate our football, and we certainly don't want to deflate the counsel of God. You must hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized for the remission of sins or forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, Be thou faithful until death and that's the whole counsel of God remember I said whatever was on the first day will be locked in until Christ comes back well isn't that what verse 39 the next verse says the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God shall call with many other words he testified and exhorted them saying be saved from this crooked generation. You know, I think if that applies on the first day of the church, if it was a crooked generation at the start, has it gotten any better? We need to be saved. Notice what be saved. The verb is passive. The verbs, you could have active or passive. Active means you do the action. Passive means you receive the action. That tells you baptism is not a work. Be baptized. Repent and be baptized. Be saved from this corrupt generation. God does the, baptism is a work, indeed it is. Colossians 2.12 says it's the work of God. Faith in the operation, the work of God. And that's the whole counsel of God. Are there any questions? Anybody have any questions here in the dining room? Any questions out here in the living room? Drew, do you have any questions? You gonna rock the house? Shake the camera? Let's pray. Great God and Father in heaven, thank you so much for this wonderful time, God. Uh, just elucidating all the scriptures, all the things that are involved with salvation in the name of Christ. I pray that none of us miss out on heaven. I pray that all of us obey the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.